Hello, and welcome to this presentation on linear eigenvalue buckling analysis using ANSYS Workbench Mechanical. In this demonstration, we'll see how to take finite element analysis, consider static loading on a structure, and find load factors on the applied static loads that would cause buckling. We'll have a model of a long bar, make it simply supported, compress it, and discover how it might buckle. You'll find out the method of buckling analysis and the associated load factors and how to observe the buckling mode shapes that result. To perform eigenvalue buckling analysis, we start back on the project page. We drag and drop a static structural system. With that in place, we go and we find the eigenvalue buckling analysis and drop it on the solution cell of the static structural system. That results in a connected eigenvalue buckling analysis that employs the same material properties, the same geometry, and the same mesh and contacts and other settings as the structural run. Results from the structural analysis are available in the setup of the linear eigenvalue buckling model so that the stress stiffening matrix can be brought in and used to deduce when the eigenvalue buckling analysis hits critical loads. Let's go here, right click, and go to Workbench Mechanical in order to see the outline that results from these two connected systems. Here's our model. Notice on the left in the outline that we have a static structural system and we have an eigenvalue buckling analysis after it that has the pre-stress state from this structural system up above. We're working with defaults here and in this case we're doing a linear static structural analysis. We're making it simply supported. At one end of the beam down here we're putting in a remote displacement and we're setting movements in X, Y, and Z to zero. We need one more thing. We need to prevent this long beam from rotating freely around its axis, around the global Z direction. So we've also prevented movement there. In using a remote point, which by default has gone to the center of this little end area, we're allowing that end to rotate around X and Y as if it was simply supported. We're allowing the end to be deformable. The result wouldn't change much if we set it to rigid, but the default deformable is fine. At the near end, we also have a remote displacement centered on the face. In this case, we're preventing movement in X and Y, but we are permitting it to compress in the Z direction, down the axis of this beam. In this case, we're also permitting it to rotate around Z. We needed that restraint for Z rotations at the far end so that the body can't simply spin freely around its long axis. We're putting a force on one end of this beam. We happen to be doing it with a remote point, and we are in fact sharing the remote point with the one that is used for the displacement boundary condition at this end as well. That's not a necessity, but it's reasonable practice. So we created a remote point centered on this face, used it in the remote displacement here. You can see it uses remote displacement to remote point. That's the name we see above. And the force is applied to that same point in space. We have the conditions now for a static structural analysis with a body that is not free to rotate and translate in space. Here's the mesh branch. We're setting relevance to 50 just to increase mesh density a little bit. Let's generate a mesh. It's a coarse mesh. It'll approximate the bending stresses for the mode of deformation, but we'll use it as a quick approach. Let's go to the static structural run and solve. 
you can see a constant state of stress and the deformation is on the left hand side compressing it towards the far end. We can get a sense of what that compression looks like if we simply animate it. Now we'll move on to the eigenvalue buckling analysis. Our pre-stress is coming from the upstream analysis. In our analysis settings, let's try four modes rather than just one in order to find out if there are other ways of buckling that might be a concern. Although you might be interested in the lowest load factor that produces buckling, it's usually a good idea to look at more than one mode of buckling. Let's go to the solution branch, right click and solve. It's done. The first thing to do is go look at these load multipliers. Now we applied a remote force of 100 newtons along the z-axis. Go back here, a factor of 77 multiplied by that, producing 7700 newtons, is what would cause the first mode of buckling. If you click on these, right click, you can create mode shape results. Once you see what they contain, you can go here and look at the first mode of deformation. If I do a right hand view and turn on the undeformed wireframe, you can see what the deformation looks like. Here's the second mode of buckling with a higher load factor, much higher. A third mode of buckling, we'll need to go to a top view to see it. And you can see that buckling the other way around the stronger axis would be the third mode of buckling with again a much higher load factor. Let's go to an isometric view. And the fourth mode of buckling is again around the weaker axis and you can see that there are three peaks in that mode. So in this particular case our first mode of buckling is the one that we would expect to see and it's typical for what happens if you take something as simple as a ruler and push the two ends together. Let's go back up and look at the stresses. Now this is 1.3 megapascals. If you're talking steel that's far, far below yield stress. Even if you multiply that by 77, you're only up around 100 megapascals in compression, which is not going to make most steels go into yielding, but it would cause failure through eigenvalue buckling. In this demonstration, then, we've illustrated how you connect a static structural analysis with an eigenvalue buckling analysis that considers the stresses and deformations in the linear static structural run and finds out load factors that could cause buckling. Thank you for joining me.